you seem mm. to me to be the antithesis of a military school guy from my experience with you in the art department at Wyndham College. Right or wrong? <laughs> uh, well, that's hard to say about Wyndham College because, in a sense, I was in the role of, uh, of uh, anti-hippie. And in the art department, of course, that is, is a, uh, it attracts self-indulgence, it can, among, among students who think there are no blue, no blue books and uh, no, uh, <coughs> uh, at, any, at any rate, that's the fear. It certainly was the fear among the uh, English department and the history and the philosophy department, certain people who wanted to drive the art department out into the swamps where it belonged, um, they wanted, uh, they preferred the Oxford-Cambridge idea that uh, there be an art conservatory uh, not given credit for uh, an art conservatory somewhere else. <laughs> they, uh, uh, at any rate, that was that was a general that was an attitude. So, in a sense, I I had to be a bit of a policeman, uh, just to protect the art department, make sure uh, the the standards were high, and they, they were high. I mean, the tra the training was uh, rigorous. So, in that sense, I suppose I was a little bit military, but uh, in fact. I was a, uh, a small boy during the Second World War, and immediately thereafter, and um, started high school in 1948. So my upbringing and my fantasies were all based on war movies. That's what we played. I had been in, by the time I went to military school, I had been in uniform for five years or six years. It, Pretend uniform, <laughs> carrying carrying my rifle and playing playing war. So at age thirteen, when the catalogs came around uh, for me to go off to a boarding school, uh, the uh, <clears throat> uh, the military school was really very attractive to me. When we were up and rolling uh, after Jennifer and uh, and then Farrakis came on board. Uh, by that time, we were attracting some very high quality students whose subsequent careers have proven us out. I mean, they're, yes, um, you know, quite dedicated and adventurous, um, uh, conceptually inventive, and hardworking. <laughs> and we worked them very hard when I left. Uh, Wyndham, or Wyndham left me, uh, <coughs> we might say uh, Wyndham went uh, bankrupt essentially in 76, and, and, it, and it went on for a couple of years with a uh, different uh, administration. Uh, I went, I taught at several universities after that, uh, and one principally at Drew University, uh, which is a very highly regarded New Jersey um, university. And it was like the art department was like kindergarten compared to Wyndham. We had very, uh, very high standards. And, and we had, uh, our advanced students had their own studios and we, it, was, it was like graduate school in there. And everybody, if you can remember, at the end of the term, everybody had shows. It just started with the graduating people. They were required to put up a show, which meant an opening, which meant cheap wine at <laughs> festivities. And pretty soon, other groups decided they wanted to have shows, too. <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, it was, yeah, it was a going place. And, and crazy and very professional. Yeah. Uh, that changed over the years. When I first came there uh, in 1964, uh, of course, it was pathetic, <laughs> the school. <laughs> we had one, one dormitory up on the hill, 
Um, and uh, <clears throat> it was probably, well now, who, would, who, who did I run into? People from Putney School considered it really a rather low, a low grade endeavor down there. The level of the students was not very high uh, in general. Uh, they, we had brilliant exceptions right from the beginning, you know, some really extraordinary people, but very often uh, we were taking, the school was almost on the rocks in 64, and, um, and uh, we took any warm body who could pay the freight, uh, it seemed. So the, uh, but that wasn't a general rule, as I say. We, we, we always, I, probably because of the location, uh, at, that, uh, at that time, we always had some really quite brilliant people. Uh, in, uh, so, uh, but we were trying very hard those first couple of years uh, to look like, Look like a college. I mean, we were going through all sorts of antics. The uh, the new president, Gene Winslow, came in, and he said, "Look, when we have a you know when we have a faculty lecture, I want all the rest of you there. <laughs> you know, we have to have an audience." <laughs> it was that it, you know that sort of thing. We were really making do, and uh, and uh, George Sulos and the music, who was the music department, and I were kind of the public face uh, because of concerts and art exhibits. I mean, to some degree, we were the public face in the community. So I really energetically got to work, and I was driving down to New York and bringing back some very good shows, uh, 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 even before we had a place to show them. I mean, uh, I was in the in the Museum of Modern Art, and, and I looked up and saw a Helen Frankenthaler painting. Helen Frankenthaler was at that time, uh, well, she still is very famous. She's uh, deceased now, but, uh, uh, and, and I, I just loved this big painting of hers. So I wrote her a letter when I came back, and yeah, I said, you should have a sh show in our college. I didn't realize at the time that she had gone to Bennington, so she probably had some affection for Vermont, but she wrote back and she said, sure. <laughs> And so that was one of the first shows uh, we had. Uh, we had it was a Helen Frankenthaler show. We had n no place to show. Uh, the library had just been built, so whatever year that was could have been '66 by then. So we hung it in the library. They had to be small paintings, and we had other notable New York artists. So that began, and, and um, so. I remember going up to Marlboro because I, uh, Frank Stout started teaching at Marlboro the second year I was there. And I was very envious of Marlboro. It was so, the students were so hip. The theater department up there was great, you know, that, that they would uh, put on. And um, it wasn't many years before I was he hearing that the people in Marlboro looked at looked at Wyndham as, you know, the really happening place where, you know, through our shows, the, you know, it, was, it was just very active on the music. We acquired, acquired a music department uh, with a top-rate cellist, David Wells, international performer, and uh, Joe Shore, who's another New, New York professional uh, orchestra violinist. And con we had and concerts and summer programs and such. so the community soon came to see it as a and the film series of course that was you remember that and the theater of course the theater series then Joe Greenhoe came in and started putting on really good things so the first couple of years it was s s small and uh, not great achievement but. Thanks to the baby boom and probably the Vietnam War era was just at the time when they were ready for college. 
so the the two more or less coincided in a lot of small colleges started up in New England it was very attractive and we uh, I mean an attractive area the uh, you know Walter Hendricks was a <laughs> brilliant brilliant at publicity and he knew you know a small liberal arts New England college carries a cachet that that is is worth something. It's not as if we were in North Dakota or, or uh, some place like that. In the town, there was certainly a conservative element, and that started pretty early. And uh, people associated, particularly with the Putney School and the Wyndham faculty, and just in general, the out of town people. Uh, ran into some difficulties, even threats of, uh, and, and at one point there was a uh, sign put up in the mid right in the middle of, uh, in front of the general store in the middle of the company, that, as I recall, it was Pinko's Pacifists, because there, there, were, there was a Quaker organization, Pink, Pinko's Pacifists and Aliens, perhaps, I don't know, if they, whatever, uh, get out of Putney. And uh, they met it, you know. I mean, they were. You know, they, it was a strenuous, anti-communist, uh, anti, anti-anti-war group, which overturned the uh, Putney Central School, really, and and and, and the uh, uh, three teachers always harbored. MATs who was wor who were working for a pittance got fired. Uh, you know, so three of their best teachers um, from Putney Central. From, from Putney, Sundra Putney Central. Putney Central. Yeah, and that was part of the to the town feeling there, and um, the um, yeah. So there there was a key vo key vote on the Putney school school board. Uh, there were three members. And there were two, two of them from the Putney School. Uh, one was a woman who ran the farm, and the other was Bill Darrow of Green Mountain Orchard, and the third was Roy Stromberg of Green Mountain Well, a uh, World War II vet. Anyway, and, and Roy was pretty damn conservative <laughs> in, in his views, according to the rest of us. And, and so the... Uh, uh, the one, one woman, woman retired from the board, the woman who was the Putney School far, farmer, head, head of the farm, uh, and uh, the, there was an election and one of Stromberg's assistants was uh, uh, appointed or elected, and that simply turned, turned the two against three again, and anybody with liberal tendencies. In fact, the whole idea of putting, not having your desks in line, you know, but having them in a circle, that was forbidden. Uh, oh, it was, quite a, it was quite a time at the Putney Central School, yes. As the 60s rolled on, the, the, town, the town that came in contact with the college was sort of aghast and amazed. Well, I, can't, I don't know what to think, but I, I'm, You'll have to help me because you were there. The um, I'm confusing the flower, the fl flower children and the hippies. Uh, were they si simultaneously, or I would I, say I, so, I, more or less. Yeah. There was a girl named Ritzy, who lived up in the dormitories, and at that time, and at that time, she wore kind of Indian long flouncy dresses. She was a curvaceous young thing, um, and uh, generally no shoes, but uh, bells around her ankles. So the other girls in the dormitory beat her up. <laughs> he said, take off those bells. And she said, I'm free. <laughs> so they freed her. So she got in an apartment down by the... Uh, paper mill. Behind, um, behind the paper mill there were some inexpensive apartments and she would go flouncing past the paper mill. <laughs> uh, 
in the, in the morning uh, on their way up to class with, her, with their bells jingling. Um, and uh, the fellows working in the paper mill would hang out the window and, because she was quite bouncy. <laughs> and, she just like, and they used to hang out and gave cat calls. So, so uh, one morning, I didn't see this. Apparently, she, she mooned them. And she was <laughs> she hoisted her skirts and showed her backside, but she wasn't wearing any underwear in any way. And uh, I like to think of the paper mill guys staggering backwards from the impact, but I wasn't there. I like. Were you there when Big Bruce was? He lived down by. I was living on Main Street. Yes. He's a motorcycle big, I remember heavy Bruce. guy, and he wore. Ch- Wore chains, and in the middle of the winter, he had like a black. Dress. So I don't think there was any political involvement in either of these people. These were these were not necessarily anti-war. There, but he he was quite a spectacle. He had a big old Har- Harley, didn't he? And he looked like a Harley. He looked. Like a... <laughs> it's hard to think of him as just being a kid. <laughs> he was quite, quite big, but I remember mid-winter and sort of bare-chested with a uh, leather vest on Snowden. Bruce Snowden, yes. No relation to the current hero <laughs> of liberation. Uh, no, but more seriously, Somewhere in that time, I mean, the progression of students was very interesting. When I first started teaching, they came, the students came to drawing class wearing sport coats, the boys. You know, they were dressed for college. Um, I remember they called me Dr. Roan. I'm not a doctor, so I put a stop to that. But, <laughs> but it was very formal. And it didn't seem to be... That many years later, when like a student will like stand up and say, "Where do you get off telling us what to do?" You know, I am a free spirit essentially. I want to do. You know, I said, "Well, perhaps you have a point. Let's discuss that." <laughs> you know, we were, this was te- teaching drawing. This was. I don't. That's not verbatim, but it was, it was kind of an attitude. You know, if I present a problem. You say, and somebody else can think, that's not the way I define art. I define art as coming from inside me. You know, these are serious people. And as the, Viet, the, the draft became ominous to these people, I had the gradual realization that these kids are older than I am in terms of their connection to dire, concrete things in the world. You know, they're on the, they're on the verge of getting sent over to Vietnam. They could, they could be. It's in their minds. So there was, you know, I mentioned Bruce Snowden, that is, that's one side, but there was a very serious side to this that was going on, and how I can't say a step-by-step transition, how these intermingle between flower children and psychedelic art and smoking pot and, and what. And I remember picking up a oh, beautiful little girl and her boyfriend were walk, walking to school through the snow or something. And, they, and she was telling me, Oh, they'd been over to Newfane to visit the prisoners in the jail. You know, saying, oh, and she said, oh, you know, they are, re- they are real people. They are real people. You know, she said. Uh, and so there were, it was, it, was a, a, it was a time of that, a time of kind of awakening to politics and, uh, and of course, it's, not that long after the uh, the uh, freedom 
freedom marches? What do we call them in the South? The integration of the freedom the, ride. Free, the freedom rides. That was Is 1961, that, actually. So a little bit before this. Just a little before, but it was still part of that. It was just at this time that John Douglas made his uh, his movie of. Um, Strike City, which he went down and lived in, I think it was in Georgia, on a, with uh, plantation workers who had gone on strike against their plantation. So that was uh, that was in the middle 60s. Because John taught for me, uh, for the art department, he taught a course. This one, and he go, he's still going strong in, in, in his uh, work up in, uh, in Burlington and uh, doing great work. Yeah, showing showing his work a lot, but he was a, and it was John. And he's the person you should interview about this because he was in the thick of it, uh, and he was there. He was an an irritant uh, to me because he would come around and he he the idea was, if you're not part of the pro solution, you're part of the problem, and he felt that Chuck Jenever. And I should probably give up our give up our art and go to work uh, in opposition to the war. And I, well, probably like John himself, but I, yeah. I, I was not interested in politics. I had not been particularly interested. I came into it slowly. Yeah, there. Whereas John had the, had the Red Clover Commune going and had some very heavy hitters in the anti-war movement uh, coming up and staying there and and do you remember some some of them um, Bernadine Dorn no I don't think she was there we could call John and find out he's quite available. Um, I think maybe Tom Hayden was there, later senator. I think he came. I don't. He didn't live there, but I think he was nearby. Um, Spent some time in Putney. Oglesby. Um, Carl Oglesby. Carl Oglesby was around, but he didn't live there. Um, I don't know. But John was very involved. John went to. He went to Hanoi to uh, to make a movie. He, he made a movie uh, with, with a group during, during the war. No, not really. I th personally, I thought he was kind of heroic. I, uh, Winslow, for all his excellence, was a bit of an irritant. <laughs> Could be. He's a tough, a tough captain. Um, and we all admired Bill for standing up to Winslow. When Winslow tried to boss him around at one time, and, and, and Bill quietly refused. He, I, th I thought of him as sort of a Gary Cooper type. <laughs> but, uh, Could you give, give me an example? Is there something you know of where Eugene Winslow, the president of Wyndham College, was standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with Bill Graham? No, no, and I didn't see it, and I don't know if it happened more than, one, more than once. Do you no, remember Winslow, the issue? Winslow was terrific as in terms of the war. He was the first college president in the entire country to publicly come out against the war, and um, and he, uh, yeah, he was very, he was fervent about that, and had people. We, one of the last commencement speakers was Francis Fitzgerald, who wrote that wonderful book about the war, and this. Suppose the war was still going on, yeah, with under Nixon, but it called uh, "Fire in the Lake." Oh yeah, yeah, it was a bestseller. I have a and copy of that at home. Yeah, and then I was trying. I'm trying. I can't all the way down here. I, I he had uh, can't remember his name. He won two Nobel prizes. He was the vitamin C guys, but he was a, phys a physicist. He got a he got the Peace Prize and he got a physics prize. Not the same year. And he came and spoke here. I, I sat on the grass at a picnic uh, with him. Uh, very famous physicist. But Linus Pauling. No, Winslow was, was terrific about that. He was a real leader uh, in that. I didn't have long hair. But when I first came in 64, which is before, 
when the uh, Vietnam War was just a glimmer in somebody's eye. Um, I was dazzled by the Putney School kids because they had Beatles haircut. You know, oh, I, they look like girls. You know, these are the Putney School kids. You know. No, I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't remember that. But they actually forcibly cut people's hair. Mm. Well, there you go. When I first arrived, it was pretty. It was pretty distinct. Um, You know, there were the you know there were the farm the farmers around, and probably more farmers, the orchardists, and and those people, and the and the paper mill people, uh, and then the academics, and the academic people were Wyndham College and Putney School, and they, which didn't we didn't really associate that much. Occasionally, I mean, I knew some people, but then I had a daughter who went to. Putney School, and she graduated in 76, so she was there from 72 to 76, um, and, uh, and, and we would drive, drive up the David Wells kids and, and, um, and my daughter. I lived, we lived right next door to each other on Main Street. Um, so. Now, I have no idea. Putney School, I, it was just today that something popped up on Facebook or whatever, the ranking of prep schools in the, uh, in the country. Um, and uh, the, the top 50, and Putney School is number three from the top. <laughs> uh, so there's uh, Exeter and Andover and Putney School. And goes like that. How about that? So it's well thought of generally, and I don't know. As a, I don't know what people. A lot of people don't may not have contact with it, but I think I think now. I mean, the Putney has really changed. I mean, to some extent, it's suburban. Uh, uh, there's a lot more education. And I'm just thinking. No, I was thinking with the experiment. You know, people from the experiment. Uh, or whatever it's called now, it has any <laughs> the SIT um, there. So I don't, but I don't know what but, but Putney has really quite changed. It has the next stage, and it has the yellow barn is quite big, and and also it's uh, um, no, I don't. Uh, I would imagine Putney School is held in high regard in general, and you don't. I don't know about that other class. The lower class, the lowest class, I understand, is still there because my dear friend has been doing substitute teaching at Putney Central, and she said it's, there's a lot of poverty in Putney. It's really not pretty. And she was very surprised to, to see that. She knew it in Brattleboro, but, you know, and there's some really pathetic kids in the she was talking about the lower, the lower grades is what she was dealing with, but I, you know. So as for their opinion, Putney School, I could ask my mechanic. <laughs> um, Tom, Tom has got a couple of, I know couple Tommy, guys, yeah. couple of guys working for, I, you know, I'll ask Scott. Okay. What do you think of Putney School? Yeah. What the hell is that? <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you're talking about a general change in the town, um, how would we see that? People moving in because it became a, a very attractive place. Well, it's so close to Brattleboro. Brattleboro has become a much more attractive place. I mean, it's, Brattleboro is like Manhattan compared to the Midwest, where I came from. I mean, Midwest, I'm thinking of uh, where my sister lives in Muskegon, Michigan, which is a city as big as probably the population of, no, not, not the population of Vermont, but I mean, it's, it's a city of 100,000 or something like that. And I think the amount of stuff that goes on in Brattleboro, Brattleboro, Putney, Marlboro area is just 
in a class of his own. You know, they, it would be paradise for my sister to live here. She's my sister's a musician. Um, anyway, um, you know, there's there's so much ha there's so much happening, and uh, so uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to, hard to say. I, I'm sure places like Mar Marlboro and and uh, Wyndham in a stay did a lot to make make the uh, make the area more attractive to people moving in. Probably for maybe for starting businesses for or you know these high. Why not? Why not? Why not? <laughs> but I could, you have you could do a little research on it. But I'm I'm sure the quality the, just the quality of life. It's not just the, the tax structure for starting up some high tech businesses that are around here. I called it the free farm, and eventually uh, the town officials, the county officials, the Wyndham County Sheriff's Department had to intervene, and Joe Mandel stepped in the middle of that and tried to mediate. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember that? Uh, I remember it happening. I didn't have any particular part in it. I heard, I heard of it. Yeah. What did you hear? Oh, I, I heard that the girls were uh, were working the fields bare-breasted, which was not uncommon. <laughs> the, the The swimming holes were liberated about that time, and it became embarrassing to wear a bathing suit. Uh, uh, well, one wants to conform, I suppose. You felt odd. Well, I, I just remember that how, how how strange that was. Oh, it was it was it was an extraordinary time. It was an extraordinary blossoming of time. And I'm I'm thinking back. You know, just it was just a few years later. It seems to me. It would have been in the um, uh, around 1980-81 when I was teaching. I was asked to teach a, um, um, <clears throat> a freshman seminar at Drew University, and I had these 18-year-olds, and it was mainly to get them to 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 write. So they asked, in general, the, you know, the faculty if they wanted to. to to run a freshman seminar to get the students to learn how to write, in, 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 uh better. So I did one on, in, on um, impressionism. I mean, kind of easy, easy, e easy art, ple easy and pleasant art, and and some of the theories of that. And I was talking to them about, uh, revol you know, the revolution of impressionism uh, against the establishment, and I was likening it to. To the hippies and flower children, and the and the uh, opposition to the Vietnam War. Uh, so we're really talking about uh, ten, eight, six years, or even like six years or I can't remember when, when uh, Nixon finally got out, or or when we. What, seven, was it 73 when we finally got out of At any rate. Nixon it, resigned August yeah. of 1974, uh -huh. and the last American helicopter, if you will, left yeah. Vietnam April 30, 1975. Yeah. So it wasn't that long before, actually, in our terms. But in terms of an 18-year-old, I mean, they were little children when that happened. They didn't know what I was talking about. They were so politically unaware, you know, they were... So... And they were very much like the, the students that I had first when I came to Wyndham in six in in sixty four. I mean, there was no politics of any interest to them. They so were, the pendulum had swung when the yeah, draft left. But in the middle of it, I mean, the students were extraordinary. You know, and it wasn't just taking off their clothes. It was it was like an opening up. They were so involved in the world. I mean, they could get killed. The guys, you know. Uh, they were they were on the edge of that for one thing. They were, uh, but that that uh, so they were di they were directly uh, much more directly than the faculty involved in the in the war just by that ha hanging over their heads uh, um, with their deferments and things and 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 uh, so that was reflected throughout in a kind of an. In adventurousness and 
things that would look, they were ch like childish self-indulgence on one, on the one hand, and and an a, a awakened awareness and participation in the world at the same time. It was very very interesting. I mean, you could call it either either way, uh, uh, because there was there was such a social involvement going on. And then there was LSD, and LSD in the art studio <laughs> would seem to produce all these things. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know if they were trip, tripping uh, at, at the time, but this, the psychedelic art would come in, I had to look at this stuff, and, you know, but man, you know, this is, man, this is what I feel, this is my soul, and it, uh, they all looked the same. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, uh, in, in, in that way, I had to try to change, as a faculty, yeah, I mean, I had to, you know, they, the parents were paying money. I had to give them their money's worth. They had to, like, teach them something, you know, or channel the energy. It worked very well, you know, it, uh, but it was, it was a very vibrant time. And then full of Oh well, because I was teaching printmaking, so at one time we, you know, there were continual marches, you know, and the uh, silkscreen studio would go in there and say, "We, we're, we're marching. We're having a march against the war. We need posters. We have it." You know, all of a, all of a sudden we gather and we're cutting out letters and putting on the screens to make stencils and making, making, uh, um, uh, taking over the print shop for, uh, for, for making. Uh, Silk screen posters, and you know, and we, then we did a march to Brattleboro or that, and and at that time I, you know, it gradually came around. Well, personally, I think the My Lai massacre when it came out on in Life magazine, it really moved me. Uh, uh, tremendously, I um, I tried to make art out of it. My my art had been at that time was abstract uh, and uh, and rather ele elegant. I mean, the, I was in the lyrical abstractions vein at that time. You know. I was on the block. I mentioned Helen Frankenthaler and this sort of thing. Great flowing veils of color and quite, quite elegantly and kind of a perfection of form. And here I'm struck with that and I'm thinking, Roan, you've got this tool. Use it. You know, do say something. You have a voice. Say something. And I worked for some time and I, I couldn't. I could do cartoon. I called it that, but I couldn't get the strength of art into the strength of my feeling. I couldn't be Goya without imitating Goya or Picasso or Guernica. You know, I, I mean, I could have. Done, I had the chops to do it if I wanted to imitate, but I—that's not. I really, I destroyed that work, and I'm sorry I did because it was pretty. Let me ask. Pretty gritty, yeah. <clears throat> but of course, I mean, art, the learn, learning of art is like it's a very intriguing thing in itself. So some of you know, the best students didn't, were, were not, I don't remember anti, any anti-war art pieces. I mean, the students were involved because they were involved in life. So they're involved in, you know, like, as in marching and going to Washington and uh, and, and uh, surrounding the Pentagon and, and that sort of thing. Of, I don't remember it being translated into into art. I'm trying to think of the sculpture department, but there was a lot of f ferment in the art department. Um, and uh, and a lot of it through through Jennifer and Farrakis, who were uh, Wind Wyndham had what has proven to be really historic 
uh, exhibits in, in conceptual art. Now, conceptual art is is much bigger in Europe than it is here. But I mean, art, artists that uh, have just had uh, one man shows in at the Metropolitan, at the, no, at the uh, at MoMA, at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, Larry Weiner and uh, Carl Andre, who just has had a big retrospective in, at the Dia Foundation in Beacon, New York, one of the uh, premier uh, <coughs> exhibition places. Um, their, their first public show was at Wyndham, uh, one, of, one of the, uh, because uh, Chuck Jennifer, who's not a conceptual artist, uh, recognized their work when they were just beginning it in New York. He was in New York at the same time and got very interested in this I, you know, the ideas of, of conceptual art, which, in, in which the form is not important. It's a, it, it makes a complete thought. So anyway, and and I saw last year at the Dia reconstruction of, of Carl Andre's famous uh, piece that he did at Wyndham. We call it, uh, they had no budget. We had no budget. He got a truckload of uh, hay hay bales, or straw bales, and, uh, and uh, the end of the quadrangle, which is now a parking lot, was went right up into the woods at that time, and then it came, came into the, where the colonnade was, and, and the, the grassy area. And he took a you know, several hundred yard, uh, well, I don't know, 150 yard, long line of hay bales coming out of the woods and halfway across the camp, camps went. And the title was Joint. And this was, I mean, this is perfect. <laughs> and perfect for Wyndham. <laughs> there were a lot of joints around in this grass. And it joined the campus to, you know, it was a lovely thing. And uh, Larry Weiner, who now does uh, words exclusively and he's very you know he's he's one of the most famous artists in the world uh, now and uh, he, he just does words in place you know just you know, a short phrase uh, but he he was still doing form at that time so he did a piece of a twine twine grid between the uh, um, to the dor dormitories by that time, we had more than one dormitory. I remember. Yes. <laughs> I can't remember. I remember going home to my house and sitting there, and because the faculty got together and we said, "Well, with our free time, for which we were getting paid, <clears throat> that we would devote our time to doing something for the uh, uh, for the anti-war effort uh, in in our." Own ways, and then we, then we just disbanded. I'm not. We didn't compare notes afterwards. I don't know what other people did, but I did this, and then and then I took off. Which is, I meant this to be uh, just telling the story in a simple way, simplified way for the hard hats. The hard hats were the. Uh, uh, the pro war, the pro war people, which we considered kind of the proletariat, the uh, you know the work, the working stiffs and their families, who believed the propaganda, uh, the patri patriotic pa propaganda that was being fed out uh, by truckloads <laughs> in those days, you know, uh, and. Uh, so that's so I did that, and then I went off to France because <laughs> that was my sabbatical year, <laughs> and uh, left it left it with a, a student who was said uh, he had contact with the publisher. He didn't see it was going to be published and it was going to be distributed to to what? So this book that I'm holding here, yeah. this oh. this funny book <clears throat> that I'm holding here, yeah, that was yeah. references the spring of 1970 after the Kent State shooting. Mm -hmm. This was published. No. Sorry. No, I, ca I came back. I came back from a, a thirteen months in France, painting 
painting, and uh, no, it, it was it just sat there. The the student. So it's been sitting for years. It. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've given it out to some friends. I that. And you've written on it. I regret that it is still timely. Yes, and I regret that I didn't spend more time with the cover when I came back. <laughs> so this just seems to be the cover that goes with with it. You know, well, maybe you'll be inspired to do that now, huh? Well, I, I, I could probably write. But, but anyway, that's that's the story. I, I, that's because I I think I, I put it in an exhibit. I had an exhibit when I came back. I can't remember what I. Hastily did that, but that time we had some great faculty there. We had uh, who were uh, who were who were fervent. You know, really well. There's uh, there's Westing, who uh, Arthur Arthur Westing, um, and uh, and Michael Rice was in science. Do you remember him? He wore, always wore a dashiki. What was he? he had curly hair. So he was must have been mixed, uh, some some delightful mixture of races. I don't know what he was. Uh, uh, it never occurred, <laughs> never occurred to me. I had to pay it. <laughs> Seemed to pay much attention to that sort of thing. And we and we <coughs> went to Washington and loaded up the kids in the microbus and uh, at the time and and went went to Washington. I gradually came around, but uh, I, I remember the the. Uh, the, the Myla, I think, as being sort of a turning point. For you personally? Yeah, yeah. You but I you do were... remember John Douglas and, and, and his, his lady coming by. And, and I said, oh, John, good, John is coming by to visit. And it's certain that they came, come, came by to proselytize it. You know, and oh, come on, get off my back, you know. <laughs> John would say, these guys, these, these generals are crooks. They don't know what they're doing. They're not telling us the truth, he says. And um, John's, <coughs> um, John's father was the undersec had been the undersecretary of the Air Force. And he, <laughs> John knew, knew some of these generals. And I don't think at, during the Vietnam War, but he, anyway. but. John John was very fer fervent, very fervent about that, and uh, and I said, John, John, no, no, they may be mistaken, but they're not, they're not lying. No, I mean, they, they, you know, they mean well, and they can make make me play. And I, I didn't. I, it took me a while to see the the horror of it. You know, they were, you know, they were saying that they're defending us against communism, and John was saying they're over there for the oil. You know. Um, uh, among these things, and I said, "Oh, John, you're exaggerating," and I'm, I'm not. I think I think defending against communism was a sufficient reason in their in their minds to to do this. But I, I, I mean, I just turned completely against the war, and this recent, I sort of got a bit of commit comeuppance about my opinions in here at, with that film. Of the uh, of the last helicopter out of um, out of last uh, days in Vietnam. Uh, last days in Vietnam that, that recently came out because there were in writing this I had considered the well this is very simplified a very simplified story it's meant to be in it but it's probably more or less what I understood but I hadn't really thought of the the below the high command of the South Vietnamese the you know the 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 generals so that I sort of made fun of here as, as being uh, Frenchified and Europe, Europe, you know, European and and and, and uh, that they uh, that there were a lot of, there are a lot of South Vietnamese that genuinely did not want to be taken over and were fight you know fighting bravely and and were very afraid of the North Vietnamese coming down, you know, didn't didn't want them so. So my my book and my take I don't know if I wouldn't have been any more it, it's it's a nuance I wouldn't have been pro war or pro continuation of the war I don't think but it I I was struck by that by the their testimony in that movie of these people of like you know, like working very hard and bravely 
uh, to, you know, to, to fight back the North Vietnamese. One thing about the, qua the quality of, uh, of Wyndham College during that time, the quality of the students. I always remember that it was, uh, I think it was the English teacher. I didn't actually know him. I think his name was Eric Davis. Did you ever know him? But he put up in the, in the student union um, a sort of plinth, a little stand. And on it he had a, uh, and this is right in the entrance of the student union where everybody passes to the snack shop and this and that and everything. So it was, couldn't have been more public as you, as you came in. Uh, he had a book made and bound that was about the size of an unabridged dictionary. It was like it was six inches thick. In the beginning. It was all blank paper. And he, what did he call it? The no, the novel. I don't know what, if it had a name. It just had. Thing. And then there were pens. And people could write whatever they wanted. And I remember coming in. There was always somebody there writing writing away, writing their stories. I, I, I don't know, that really sort of exemplified something about the, the quality of, of Wyndham at that time. I, uh, I mean, it, was a great, it was a great school. It was really a great school. Um, everything that goes on. And, I, and, and certainly the fervor, the fervor of the war, uh, that engagement, you know, that quality of engagement with in, in, in life. It, it, it went all through the school, through the faculty and everything. So it's hard to separate the war from just this sense. But there was definitely a sense that changed in the, for me in the middle 60s, I think. These kids are grown-ups, <laughs> you know. <laughs> They're more than I am. I mean, I went through the University of Michigan. Uh, for two years, I was the, uh, car the art editor of the humor magazine of this vast university. I mean, how many, you know, the, and this was during the McCarthy hearings and things like I had no interest in politics. I couldn't care less. My cartoons were like, you know, New Yorkerish sex cartoons, drinking, doo -doo, you know. No I didn't, draft, I, David. Yeah. No draft. No draft. That funny, unshaven guy on the black and white television and the return to the house. But now I think now, I, I, I had a voice. I could have said something. You know, there were, uh, but it was, very, it was a very engaged place. Mm -hmm.